This is a pre-lab lecture video for experiment 5 where we will be measuring the Ka of an indicator. Hopefully you remember from your lecture that an indicator helps to indicate what the pH of a solution is and it does that by changing colors at different pH levels. One of the concepts that we'll be using in this lab is Beer's Law. And Beer's Law states that the intensity of color or absorbance of a substance is proportional to the concentration of a substance. Where A is the absorbance, E is the molar absorptivity, so this is a constant which depends upon the nature of the colored species. B is the path length, and C is the concentration of the colored species. So with B we'll be using the same path length, we'll, so we'll be using the same cubet size for all of our samples but we'll be changing the concentrations of the, the species so that by using the relationship that concentration is proportional to absorbance we'll be able to set up a ratio of the concentrations of different species to calculate the equilibrium constant. Now remember you must record percent T, the percent transmittance from the spec 20s and then we'll calculate the absorbance from that percent transmittance. You should not read absorbance from the spec 20 because it's more difficult to accurately read the log scale. The relationship of the absorbance to the percent transmittance is the absorbance equals the log of 100 over percent T. Be sure to record the percent T with the correct number of significant figures. The percent T should be read to the one decimal place, for instance 25.3, because remember the instruments marked off in one percent so you estimate the next digit over, so that would be in the tenth position. So we briefly want to describe why we see color. Because remember, uh, color is caused by an object absorbing visible light. So an electron gets excited from its ground state. So if you put in energy, it gets excited to an excited state. So when the electron moves from that ground state to the excited state, it requires some energy to do that. So the energy equals hc over lambda. So the larger the wavelength, the smaller the amount of energy, or and the shorter the wavelength, the greater the amount of energy. So the bigger the separation between the, the ground state to the excited state, the more energetic light that you need, so the shorter the wavelength that you need. Now, when a compound absorbs a color of light, let's say it absorbs at 600. If it's absorbing strongly in the yellow region, it's reflecting all the other light, but it's going to be reflecting purple the most. So it, if it's absorbing yellow, the color that we see is purple, so we see the complementary color. So let's see an example of this. We are going to be looking at bromothiol blue. This is an indicator, and we will be measuring the absorbance at four different pHs. We'll be measuring one at a very low pH, such as 2.7, and at 2.7, this peak corresponds to one to one of the species. So at 2.7 we have a maximum absorbance at 420 nanometers. So if it's absorbing strongly at 420 nanometers, this corresponds to blue light. So if it's absorbing blue light, the complementary color is orange. Now I know that we say we absorb the complementary color. This color wheel of, of one compound absorbing one color and reflecting the complementary color, this is a rough estimation. But it's be fairly close. So if we're absorbing it towards the purple end of the blue region, we'll be closer to the yellow region of the what color we see. At higher pHs, so say pH of 10, this peak corresponds to one of the other species in the blue in the bromothiol blue. So this has a maximum absorbance at 610 nanometers. So 610 is right around the yellow region of the spectrum, so it's absorbing strongly in the yellow. Well, if it's absorbing strongly in the yellow, we should see the complementary color, and it actually appears blue. 
So this solution that's absorbing yellow light, it appears blue to us, and this compound that's absorbing blue light appears yellow to us. The bromothymol blue is an indicator, and it's actually a weak acid. So we can write an equilibrium reaction associated with that. Rather than writing the entire formula of the bromothiol blue, I'm just going to write IN for indicator, and I'm going to have a hydrogen out front to indicate that this is the protonated form of the indicator, so you have an acidic hydrogen. So in this reaction, I've had the HIN, so the indicator dissociating like an acid and it producing the proton, or I could write it as the hydronium ion, and it produces the counter ion, so the IN minus. So this would be the conjugate base of the weak acid. Now if I write my mass action equation, remember it's products over reactants. And our goal of this experiment is to find the Ka of this bromothiol blue. Well, you'll see that we'll be measuring the pHs of our solution. So if I know the pH by measuring it, I can calculate the H plus concentration. So the other pieces of the puzzle that I'm going to need to find the Ka, I'm going to need to see what the In concentration is and the HA concentration is. So the protonated form of the indicator, so let's just go and write HIN right there. So the protonated form of the indicator and the deprotonated form. So if I can find a ratio of these two, I can then calculate my Ka. Now at low pHs, low pH means you have a high H plus concentration. So if I have a high H plus concentration, this concentration goes up, and this is going to push my equilibrium to the left so that all my indicator is in the form of the HIN. So at low pH, all of my indicator, my bromothiol blue, is in the form of the HIN, and it's going to appear yellow. But at high pH, high pH, you have a low concentration of the H+. So if I write my equilibrium reaction again, so if my H plus concentration goes down because my, my pH is going up, so I have lots of hydroxides in solution. The hydroxides react with the H plus to make water. My H plus concentration goes down. So that's going to shift my reaction to the right I'm going to have less HIN, so that I'm going to have less protonated form of my indicator, and the IN minus, the deprotonated form, is going to go up. So at high pHs, so something like a pH of 10.07, all of my indicator is in the form of the IN minus. So this IN minus corresponds to this peak right here, so this large peak absorbing at 610. So it appears blue at high pHs, but it's actually absorbing yellow-orange light. Now for moderate pH samples, say let's say around 7, you're actually going to be recording the absorbance of two different pH solutions at, in this moderate range when you take your data sample. But let's say one of your moderate range is around 7. For the moderate pH samples, there's going to be a mixture of the protonated and the deprotonated form. So this pink line represents a mixture of the two different species. Because we have an in-between pH, we've got some in the deprotonated form. So this is what's indicated by this peak here. But we also have some in the protonated form, which is what's represented by this absorbance at 420 nanometers. Now we said that we could determine the H plus concentration by measuring the pH, but we need the A minus concentration, the HA concentration, so that we can find the Ka. So that's our ultimate goal of this experiment, is to determine the Ka of our indicator. So to do this, we're going to derive the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. The first step is to take the log of both sides. So that gives the log of Ka equals the log of the H plus times the A minus over the HA. Once we do that, then we can take and separate the H plus and the A minus over the HA by using our, log, our rules of log. So we're separating 
uh, our right side out. Then we multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1 so that we get the negative log of the Ka equals the negative log of the H plus minus the log of the A minus over the HA. So hopefully you're starting to recognize what I'm doing. So why in the world would I want to take the negative log? Well, if I take the negative log, I can replace those with P's. So the negative log of the Ka equals the PKA. The negative log of the H plus equals the PH. And then we've got the negative log of the A minus over the HA. Then we're going to take the A minus and the HA. We're going to use this relationship here. So our last step is we need to find some way to find the A minus concentration over the HA concentration. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to use the absorbances to replace those concentrations because using Beer's law, the concentration is proportional to the absorbance. So we're going to be able to replace this. So the A minus is going to correspond to the AB minus A min and the HA is going to correspond to the A max minus AB. So where in the world do these ABs and A mins and A max come from? Let's discuss that. Okay, so we previously, you know, established what our indicator acid-base reaction is. So we have the HIN, you know, dissociates to form the proton and the conjugate base. And we said that at low pHs, all of it is in the form of the HIN. So at low pH, so at low pH, that means you've got a high H plus concentration. And a high H plus concentration means that this is going to be pushed to the left. And so at low pH, all of this, your indicator is going to be in the protonated form. And it's going to be absorbing at 420 nanometers. But at high pH, high pH, we have low H plus concentration. So if the concentration is low, that's going to push the reaction to the right. Because if the H plus is low, it's going to shift to the right to make more H plus. And when it does, it's going to force all the HIN to the IN minus form. So at high pHs, it's going to appear blue, but it's going to be absorbing yellow-orange. Now when we take our data, we're going to need to find the biggest difference between our, what we're going to call our A min and our A max. So there's a bigger difference between this minimum value and this maximum value here at 610 than there is at any other data point. And this is going to be the data which we're going to do all, this is going to be the wavelength at which we're going to do all of our calculations at. So if hopefully you get a graph that looks something like this, and so you want to pick the maximum value and that should come at 610 nanometers. So this A max value corresponds to the maximum amount that will be absorbed at this wavelength. And if we're at a very high pH, all of our indicator is in the form of the IN minus. So this is the maximum amount this, this will go. So this will correspond to our total concentration. So the difference between the A max and the A min will correspond to our total concentration of the indicator that we have in there. Now, if we're at a in-between pH, so we're looking at the pink line again, this AB, the absorbance of this in-between region, so that B just means between. So this absorbance is, that's in-between our A min and our A max. We're going to use this to find the ratios of the protonated and the deprotonated form of our indicator. So at moderate pHs, the absorbance between the AB to the A min is going to be proportional to the concentration of the deprotonated indicator. So this portion here corresponds to the IN minus. Well, if A max to A min represents the maximum amount that it can go, then the difference between the A max to the AB represents the other portion of the indicator, so in the protonated form. 
So the lack of absorbance from A max to the AB is proportional to the concentration of the HIN. So everything that absorbs at this peak is due to the IN minus, but the lack of it absorbing from this region to here is going to be due to that protonated form. So again, the A max to AB, this lack of absorbance here, because imagine corresponds to the HIN values. So let's see how we can use that relationship between the ABs and the A mins and the A max. So the total concentration of the indicator has got to be equal to the sum of the protonated form of the indicator plus the deprotonated form of the indicator. And remember on the previous slide we said that the at 610, because remember we're only going to be looking at this one wavelength here at 610 nanometers. The absorbance from the A min to this AB corresponds to the IN minus concentration and the A max to the AB corresponds and that lack of absorbance corresponds to the protonated form. But the only thing that absorbs at this wavelength is the IN minus. So we're going to use this relationship that the indicator in the deprotonated form compared to its con total concentration is going to be proportional to the or this be the same as the difference between the AB minus the A min over the A max minus A min and this is due to the fact that we can use Beer's law so the A equals E B C that absorbance is proportional concentration. So the ratio of the part to the whole for the concentrations will be equal to the ratio of the part of the absorbance to the whole absorbance. So that's how we're using the absorbances to get our ratios of our concentrations. Now for the IN minus, if I solve my, for my IN minus, it's going to be the IN minus equals the AB minus the the A min over the A max minus A B times the total concentration. And I can do a very similar thing for my protonated form of the indicator. So this is the A max minus A B over the total um, absorbance that's possible times the total concentration. Now I'm going to do a ratio of the indicator in the deprotonated form over the protonated form. So the I N minus over the H I N. So I'm going to take this and divide it by this. So when I set that up, notice that my total concentrations will cancel out. So I don't even have to know my total concentrations because eventually they're just going to cancel out with each other. And then the A max minus A min, this will cancel out with the other A max minus A min. So this leaves us with the ratio of the IN minus over the HIN is equal to the AB minus the A min over the A max minus AB. So this is where we need this for the Henderson Hasselbach. So the PKA equals the PH plus the log of the IN minus over the HIN. So we can use this value to substitute in for here. Whoops and take the negative log of our eight and use the pH that we measure from our pH meter add those together to get the pKa then to get the Ka we take our pKa so the 10 raised to the negative pKa to get our Ka value and that's our goal of the lab is to determine that Ka of our indicator that bromothiol blue now there is an Excel template on Blackboard for you to download. You must use that table and do your calculations in Excel. Be sure to format your cells to show the correct amount of sick figures. And when you make your graph, be sure to change to choose the XY scatter plot with smooth, li with smooth lines connecting the dots. Now with part of your taking your data into the Excel, Question 1 and question 2 are also in that Excel sheet and I want you to make sure to do your calculations in Excel because typically most students make a mistake at this point when they 
want to know the pH of the sample too if the original measurement was 0 0.10 too high. And in question two, where it says the absorbance of sample three if the original measurement was low by 0 0.03. So most people make a mistake at these two points. And if you make a mistake at these two points, the other answers will be wrong. And if you do it in Excel, it's a quick fix if you get it wrong when you check your answer. And it'll automatically update the other cells. So it'll save you time in the long run. Now there's two pages in that Excel template. The first page, if you click at the bottom, it'll say student calculations. That's the other um, sheet that we showed you on the previous slide. But if you click on the other side that says graphs, it's already got the template for the graphs, the absorbance data, or the percent transmittance that you're going to collect. So you can calculate the absorbance. Be sure to write, type in the pH of your sample up here as well. But you can find this on the other page in the Excel by clicking on the tab at the bottom. Now there's some specific lab info for this lab. Be sure that you calibrate the SPEC 20 at each wavelength with the blank. And when you start recording your percent transmittance, start at the higher wavelengths, starting with 620 and moving down to 420. The reason why we want you to do this is just in case you run out of time. And if you run out of time, at least you have the most important part of the graph to do your, the rest of your calculations. If you need help on how to use the SPEC 20, such as how to operate it, how to calibrate it, or how it works, you can either refer to the appendix in the back of your lab manual, you can see the colorimetry video that's on YouTube, or you can see the handout that's posted on Blackboard, or it will probably be printed and placed next to the SPEC 20 in the classroom. Don't bother with doing the class average or the percent error. We do not have time to do that for this lab. There is no partial credit for your answers, so be sure to check your calculations before you leave the lab. You can check your answers with the lab instructors before you leave. You will also be working in pairs, as with most labs in Chem 1B. And for this lab, it, you know, typical absorbance measurements, you should be using the same cuvette for all of your measurements. But that's going to take too long because if you do that, you'd have to clean the cuvette between each sample. You'd have to do four measurements at each of the wavelengths. And you have to calibrate at each of the wavelengths. That just takes too much time. So make your samples in four different test tubes. But just know that this is going to introduce some error because all cuvettes or all these test tubes are not exactly the same, so you might get some variances in your data. But you do need to make sure that all the test tubes are very clean with no fingerprint smudges when you take your measurements. Also, if you have any air bubbles in your samples, those air bubbles will interfere with the absorbance, so make sure you kind of lightly tap it to dislodge the air bubbles. You will have to calibrate your pH meter at the low range of the pH and at, again at when you need to do a higher measurement for the pH. So when you're calibrating at the lower pHs, use a buffer of pH 7 and a buffer of pH 4. And then recalibrate the, BA, and then recalibrate the, the meter with 7 and 10 buffers when you need to measure pHs of higher than 7. So let's talk a little bit about the usage and the care of the pH meters. So on the front of the meter, you will find the buttons that will allow you to turn on the meters and switch modes for reading data and calibration. Remember, your power button is here. And you can change the mode of which the, what kind of data that it's recording. And at the top of the meter is where you'll find where you plug in your pH electrode. Now on your pH electrode, you will find a cap with an O-ring. Removing them often results in loss of the O-ring, so do not remove the cap and the O-ring. The O-ring provides a seal so that the saturated potassium chloride solution does not spill out of the electrode storage bottle. So you can roll up the O-ring up the probes so that the cap and the O-ring do not interfere with your measurements. So simply roll it up 
and then when you're done you can roll it back down so that the probe fits nicely into your saturated solution but do not actually remove the o-ring and the cap because that typically breaks off some of the fingers on the probe be sure to rinse the probe with DI water in between readings. And remember, this is the spring-loaded handle in the back of the lab is where you can find the deionized water. And to get an accurate measurement, you need to be sure that the probe is completely submerged in the sample and you need to avoid air bubbles on the probe. When you're finished using the pH electrode, be sure to submerge the the probe back into the saturated KCL solution. The probe actually contains a semi-permeable membrane, so ions have to flow in between this membrane, so that's how it's actually measuring the pH. If that probe dries out, the probe will no longer work. So be sure that the electrode storage bottle is full of the saturated KCL solution. Do not put any other solution in the probe storage bottle other than the saturated KCL solution. If you are the last lab for the week, neatly and loosely wrap the cord around the probe and place it in the black storage block when done. But if there are other labs that need to use the pH probe after you, please leave the pH electrode attached and leave the pH electrode at your workstation and make sure that you still have the pH probe in the saturated KCL solution. The reason why we don't want you to separate the probe from the pH meter is that when the instrument's recalibrated, a different pH electrode may be attached to the instrument and it may be more difficult to calibrate the instrument. So leave the pH probe attached to the pH meter if no one else is going to be using the pH meter that week. So when you calibrate your pH meter, so if you're calibrating with the first data point, the first data point is going to be at a pH of 7. Be sure to immerse the electrode into the pH 7 buffer solution. You will then press the Cal button on the pH meter. Then the upper display text shows Cal and the lower display shows the default calibration value. The text cal will flash for around five seconds. While it's flashing, this means it's calibrating. So do not remove the electrode while the cal display is flashing, because if you remove it while it's calibrating, it will mess it up. So keep it submerged while it's calibrating. Once it stops flashing, then it's done calibrating and you can remove the electrode from the buffer solution. You will then have to calibrate at a second pH value. So you'll be either doing it at a pH of 4 or 10. So if you're doing it at a pH of 4, you'll use the pH 4 buffer. So be sure to rinse the electrode with distilled water and then immerse the electrode into the pH 4 buffer solution. Again, press the Cal button until you see the Cal display in the until you see the Cal display and the Cal display will then flash for around five seconds. Again, keep the pH probe submerged into the buffer. And then after that, your pH meter will, will be calibrated. So after the, the text finishes flashing calibrate, submerge your electrode into the pH 7 and see if the pH meter reads 7. If it doesn't, calibrate the pH 7 and then go to the pH 4 buffer again. Repeat this process until that the pH meter reads pH of 7 in the 7 buffer and a pH of 4 in the 4 buffer without recalibrating. Now if your pH meter will not calibrate, there are some things that you could do. So the pH meter cannot do the automatic calibration as described on the previous slide if the pH reading is more than one pH unit from the calibration value. For instance, if the meter reads the basic buffer, so you're supposed to be getting a pH reading of 10 as 11.31, that's more than 11. So it cannot use the automatic calibration procedure. So this is typically either caused by a previous user incorrectly calibrating with a wrong buffer or a different electrode being attached than what was previously attached and calibrated. 
So you'll have to give the pH meter to your instructor and the instructor will need to do a manual calibration. And this involves opening up the side flap and adjusting the slope uh, with a, a small screwdriver.